Okay, so I guess we are ready to go. So thank you all for coming here today. And the topic of today's presentation is Zen and the art of multi precision algorithm design. Uh, so a bit of history. I was doing Google Summer of Code project two years ago. Uh, basically, it was about Fermi diagrams. And uh, Simon Sonukanos was my mentor. So basically, it's like, the reason why I am here today is because of him, so I would like to thank you. So let's proceed. So before going to agenda for today, I would like to, to define the main topics of this presentation. Like what, what, what are the main ideas? Uh, so we'll try to define the notion of the good design for multi-precision algorithms. Like it, this is the main point of this presentation. We'll cover some techniques that uh, improve performance, that improve design, that, uh, uh, that also speed up development process a bit. And the last thing that this presentation is supposed to, uh, to inform all of you is about Boost Polygon Vermeer Library, which supposedly and hopefully will be in Boost in 1.50 version. So let's proceed. Uh, okay, so agenda for today. Uh, how many of you have attended this last year presentation by Luke? One. Okay, so how many of you know what are Voronoi diagrams? Okay, so I, I, I won't stop a lot on Voronoi diagrams itself because it's something Luke presented already. I'll just say what is, what is that, what is the definition of the concept. And after that, we'll go for al algorithm design. Uh, most of the examples would be from the Voronoi diagrams implementation, but like they, they could be ported to some other algorithms, and they would be basically the same, I would say. Uh, and then we'll have also summary and Q&A. So, uh, so Voronoi library. So, what did uh, Voronoi? Maybe some of you are wondering why it's called Voronoi, like, uh, it's not convex school, because convex, like, you can understand why that, so, basically it's named in the honor of Ukrainian mathemat mathematician, Georgi Voronoi. And the definition of the concept is, basically, it's a partition of a space onto regions that are defined by the distance to some set of, to some family of objects. Like, this definition is, generalized a lot. Like there is nothing about space, what, what, the, what are the requirements for space, what is the metric for the distance, uh, what is the input family of objects. So what we are going to do, we are going to narrow this definition. So the space we will work in is two-dimensional basically. Uh, distance is usual Euclid, Euclidean. And input objects are points and segments. Uh, we don't have support for circles or ellipses, so right now. Now let's, like, maybe definition is too complicated, now let's see what is that on images. Uh, so here we have two input sites, two input points, which have blue color. Yes? Could you just, to put this in context, why do you need to, to do this? Why do you need to define? No, why do you need to write a multi-precision library for line segments and points? Okay. Well, let me define first what is Voronoi, and after that I'll explain a bit. Okay. For applications? Yeah, but I'm like, can you give us a specific application? But why do you need multi-precision <laughs> inside Voronoi? No, why do you need Voronoi? Ah, oh, that would be, yeah, just wait a couple of slides. Okay. I just want to explain first what is that, and after that, when you understand what is it, you can literally understand why we, where we can use it. Okay, so here we have two sites, two points, is the, like, which have blue color. And this green line, which is called Voronoi H, splits basically plane onto two regions. So all the points inside this region are closer to this point than to that one, and vice versa. All the points that are in the uh, bottom left region are closer to that point than to this one. Is it okay? So what are the points close to the edge? So if you move the point, the edge will also move. 
I mean, H is defined by the points, right? Will go, it's not the single example. So, let's, have, let's say you have three points. So, now this H basically contains points that are equidistant from both blue points, like from these two. This H contains points that are equidistant from this point and from that point. The last H contains points that are equidistant from this point and this point. And basically they intersect at points that is equidistant from all of them, like from all three points. So all the points that are here, for example, are closer to this point than to and than to that one or that one. Okay, is it fine? Everybody understands? So now it's more complex. Now we have many points, like ten points. Ah, uh, so the point in the middle is basically bounded by all the other points. So it's situated inside the Voronoi cell, basically. And all the points inside that cell are closer to this point than to any other point that you can see here. So here we have only points. Now we are going to add segments. It will be more interesting. So segments. For segments, everything is the same. Like, in, uh, in the middle, you see Voronoi cell that contains uh, this segment, basically. And all the points inside this cell are closer to th that segment than to any other segment. The only difference is that for segment, so when you want to find the distance between a point and the segment, it would be one of the three distances, right? For example, if you want to find distance from this point to this segment, it would be distance from this point to this point, from this point to this point, or from this point to the segment itself. I mean, the definition is basically the same. All the points are closer to this segment, except the distance to the segment is, is a bit more complicated than the distance to a point, right? Okay. So, at this example, we have both points and segments. Another thing that you can see here is that we have edges that are perpendicular to segments and go from, like, bo from both endpoints of the segment. Why do we do that? So if you go back to this example, like, let's start from this one again. So all these lines are basically lines. I mean, they are linear. They are not parabolic arcs or something like that. So when you go to the segments, you get parabolic arcs. So, so for example, when you have two segments, this part is just also linear segment. But when you have like a set of points that is equidistant from a point and a segment, it would be parabola, not a line segment. Okay. So to represent those area around segments in a natural way, like because to make it easier to represent it in program in software, we split a segment. Yes. So, so how do you uh, determine the edge? This image or next one? This one, yeah. Okay. How do I determine the edge? And so basically, edge is a set of points that is equidistant from the closest two objects. So this edge is equidistant, well, you can see it basically, right? From this segment and from this segment. This parabolic arc, yeah. this is not a segment, is equidistant from this point and from this segment. Okay. But that, but that's like, that's because this point is closer to all these things, uh, th this segment itself, right? Yeah. Okay. So what we do basically, we represent each segment as segment itself and both endpoints as a separate sides. So if you, if you think of it like you have a segment and you have a point. So now you need to build a set, like you need to build an edge that is equidistant from both the segment and its endpoint. That would be just a perpendicular line, right? Going through, a, through the endpoint. Oh, this point, distance from the, all these points 
is basically this distance. And it's the same for segment because like all like you don't consider the endpoint, but all the other points are very close to this endpoint, right? Like they are infinitely close. This is why distance from this point is for the segment is the same as distance from this point to the point. Okay. So now we are going to talk about <coughs> application areas. So there are many application tools for Voronoi diagrams. Like uh, it's used in robotics. So basically the idea is like you have some uh, obstacles on a plane. Uh, you can discretize like some boxes with segments other than you build Voronoi diagram. And basically you receive Voronoi graph which has linear number of edges and which, is which you can use as a map for your robot to orient like on some surface like it could be using on Mars, on Moon for example or may maybe on some simple application like in the room if you want to test it so there are also other application areas all of them are listed, listed there so it, like you can actually like google it like it's really related to all of these topics it could be used to, for pathfinding algorithms um, statistics finite uh, elements method basically because Voronoi diagram is dual to DNA triangulation and it has a very nice property for finite elements method. Uh, so, yeah, so now let's talk about its relation to computational geometry structures. So basically, when you have Voronoi diagram, you have all of those. You solve all of those problems. Like you solve DNA triangulation, you solve medial axis, closest pair, all nearest neighbors, and all the others. So, I mean, it's very universal concept that gives you a way, like, to operate with all of those problems. Any questions? Okay. So, on this example, we are going to see how dual is DLNA triangulation to Voronoi diagram. So, those black dots are input sites. Input points, I call it sites usually. Because we can have like a point or a segment. That to generalize those, we call it site. So we have th these points. Here, Volnoi diagram is represented by dotted uh, by edges. Like this edge is equidistant from this point, this point, and so on. So now what we are going to do, for each edge, like this, each edge has two objects that represent it, right? This edge is represented by this point and this point. This edge is represented by this point and this point, and so on. And, well, you can see it from the image, right? So what we are going to do, we are going to join by the solid edge points that have Voronoi edge between them. So in the end, we receive these solid black edges. And those represent the linear triangulation. It has a very nice property. that the, it's, it's used for meshing, for example, uh, because the uh, smallest angle in any, like in all of the triangles, is maximum possible. So, like it, that's why it's used for finite elements because you don't have like big and red triangles with very small angles, and like that's why it is used. So, can you yeah, yeah, you know, you're it, but it's the starting point for a high level. Yes. Yes. Okay. Another thing. Probably some of you heard about medial axis. I'm going to explain. So, what is that? Medial axis is a subset of Voronoi diagram. So, on this image, you have Voronoi diagram basically. If you remove all the edges outside this closed region, like this edge, this edge, that edge, that, and that one, you'll get medial axis. It's something to explain because when we started to work on that with Luke, we, we had like a month of conversations with defining what is medial axis, what is Voronoi diagram, and if you hear it some, like somewhere. So if you need a medial axis, you are fine with Voronoi diagram. And you just need to cut the edges that go outside of the object. <coughs> One important thing. So 
manual axis and triskeleton. Those are completely different concepts. So you can't solve triskeleton problem with Voronoi diagram. Just to make it clear also, because at first we were thinking that we will be able to solve triskeleton and so on. So on the image to the left, you see medial axis. Uh, basically, it's Voronoi diagram inside that region. On the image to the right, you see stride skeleton. So, for a convex polygon, medial axis and stride skeleton are the same. For convex. Here we have not convex polygon. So, like, you can see the differences. Basically, stride skeleton doesn't have any parabolic arcs. It's only stride lines. Also, stride skeleton is not defined strictly mathematically. It's like it's it's defined more like so basically you sh you shrink your polygon and you trace lines where you shrink shrink it. That's why you have only stride lines. Also, the fastest possible algorithm to build stride skeleton, at least the one that I know, has uh, n square complex. Uh, well, has quadratic complexity basically. So like it's more. It's more complex problem. I mean, it's not more complex to, to implement it. It's more complex because complexity is higher than for one of my diagrams. So but the algorithms to implement stride skeleton is pretty simple. Like, I mean, it's just basically line intersect. You just need to compute a bunch of line intersections, and that's it. Also, another cool thing is that this uh, stride skeleton is used to build roofs for the buildings. Well, and you can see, like, most of the buildings if you look at the top of some house, right, they use some, like, some of those lines probably. So, what is the motivation to, to have a robust implementation of Voronoi diagram uh, construction algorithm? So, as you might see, there are a large variety of tools where it could be used. Uh, second of all, like, the number of robust implementations, even for the Voronoi of points, could be counted on your fingers, like it's very small. There are a few, like there are a few, but some of them are not robust. They usually fail on some, uh, uh, like some inputs. Like you, basically, you can't rely on them. Uh, so also another thing is that existing libraries have quite complex interface. How anybody of you used Seagull, for example? What do you, have you used for my diagrams or dominate triangulation? Maybe I think I think I just yeah I think I just did the like the, the Example program they have and sort of mess with it a little bit. But okay, okay. Because yeah, it's complex. <laughs> it's it's like the interface is very complex. If you need to construct, like if you need to set up objects that constructs delineate interpolation, you basically need to include like five headers. After that, you need to set up five different kernels, and after that, you need to put them into delineate interpolation data structure. Like I know how the usual user is like. I was reading their documentation also and everything else, but it's too, com it's too complex even for me. So I just asked somebody on the list to help me. Most implementations would be closed source. Uh, so there's actually a need for an open source and free implementation that's robust because it basically doesn't exist uh, before now. Yes, so number of implementations that implement or annoy our segments, like, is too small. I know just three. I've seen only one, which is Signal, basically. I haven't seen like Leda, for example, but I saw that they have it. Uh, I saw that Ronnie has it. Uh, it's written by Martin Held, but it's also commercial, so there is like no way to test it to see what it does. And yes. Oh, didn't mean to interrupt. I, I just I, I noticed recently something called Open Voronoi, which claims to do same. So I was actually I had. Uh, Quite a big mailing, oh. uh, ma mailing with the author of it. Oh, okay. uh, so basically, it's not robust. The, the first point. Oh. Uh, however, like, like it's, it's something good to have. So like, uh, and the author is Andrew Wallen. So he he wants to use it for pocket mailing. Uh, I know if you know about this. So basically, it's uh, printing three D objects, two uh, D objects. So. Uh, they use Voronoi diagrams ba basically to set up paths for this thing that uh, cuts uh, edges and everything else. Yes, but it's not robust. It is like 
50 times slower than our implementation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and of course you see the prices for the, it's price for the academic usage. It's not price for commercial usage, it's even like, I, I guess for Lele it's like $5,000 or something like that. I know, I know about Ronnie because I wasn't able to, to find it on the website of Martin Health, but I guess it's also expensive. Uh, so, so now let's talk about challenges, why, why this problem is not so easy and why it took basically two years to do something that is that is good. Uh, so there are just a few articles. Basically, I was using an article of Stephen Fortune. How many of you know about it? Okay, so it appeared to be the only article that has some relevant 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 information to be able to do some implementation stuff. I mean, all the others have some ideas. Have something else, but they don't give like any practical advices, any algorithm prototypes, or something like that. Like, they, they could say, okay, let's compute the Voronoi diagram in parallel. We will compute this part, we will compute this part, and th after that we will merge it. But they don't mention how they merge it, how they compute it, and everything else. I, I even like, I even don't know if they have implementation on their side. It looks like, like they don't. They just have some idea, and that's it. So the only practical one is the one written by Steam Fortune and basically it contains algorithm prototype in place, like general algorithm prototype, but still it's useful. It's, it's the seminal paper on it from like 1979. Yeah, it's 20 years old, even more, like 25. But it's, it's considered to be one of the best in, in the field. Uh, okay, so there are, the second thing is that the and implementation has many corner cases. Like you have, you can have circular points, basically points that, that are situ situated on the same circle, right? You, you can have uh, collinear points, which is also like one of the corner cases. Like, and there are many other. There are many for the points, and there are even more for the segments. Uh, so, well, yeah, no, basically no information on the implementation side. That's what made like made it quite complicated to use it. For Voronoi, of course, you can find something. I, I, I was able to find another article, I don't remember the authors of it, but they usually don't contain implementation details, like just some basic ideas and that's it. And the last point that make is, makes it really hard, I believe, to implement any geometric algorithm is uh, like numeric computations, uh, special handling. I mean, you can't, you, like, you can't use, for example, orientation test that is not robust. Because at some point, you'll corrupt your internal structures, and you may just set fault, for example. Or you can, proceed, you can receive something that is like some random data, data, basically. You'll receive some crossing edges, something else, like, you can't use it, basically. So, we are done with Voronoi. Now let's proceed to robustness. Uh, so, what is robustness? Uh, we'll talk about robustness as rel reliability. So, if the algorithm is robust, you can rely on it. Basically, you don't need to think that it could fail for some input. Um, well, that's it. So, you can just use it and don't think about some special cases where it could, where things could go wrong. So let's let's see some code. Uh, this is just real world example. It's not connected with computational geometry or anything else. Uh, what we are doing, we have one function which is called validate ownership. And we pass a vector of doubles to it. We use accumulate function, which bas basically just computes the sum of all the values. And after that we just compare if total is less or equal to one hundred. So it's, it's one of the things, it's, it's, this was actually used in production code. Uh, it, it's, it's not terrible, we'll see. But I mean, so here we have like three vectors of doubles. All the values are the same for most vectors. They are just permutated a bit. So can anybody, does anybody know what will be the output of this? <laughs> I 
Well, you see that sum is 100 for all of them, right? It should be. Yes, yeah, so let's just proceed. Okay, the set, the third one will fail, basically. So at this point, this is a very simple example, right? We don't use some square roots, uh, some, I know, evaluating some intersection things or something like that. This is just three values that are doubles. We just sum them up and we compare if they are less or equal to 100. But still, the behavior is not the same. Basically, input is the same, right? It's just a bit different, like we permutated. So you're saying the order that they were summed in affects the outcome? Well, I will make some summary of that a bit later, but yes, the, basically, the way you sum them up makes the output different, let's say, for this particular case. Is this because of the floating point precision of the yes. numbers? Yes. So it, to be more precise, this value, uh, 0 0.2, doesn't have exact representation in double. I mean, it's 0 0.2 something, something, something. Like some one in the end, basically. But you see, it works for two cases, and it doesn't work for the set, set case. And it was a problem in production code, actually, with this stuff. It's not actually doing an exact representation of uh, the decimal. Uh, it's, it's due to the uh, accumulation of error as you sum which can either uh, interfere constructively or destructively. Your error either goes up with each calculation or cancels out. And uh, it really depends what the numbers are, which is going to happen. We'll explain how, how why this is this way a bit later. So it depends how you are accumulating there, like how the accumulate functions work. Well, it, it depends how the processor is working. No, it, like doubles are the same for every processor, right? Yes. Well, right? yes. Well, but no. well, the important thing is to understand how they work. Yes, that's for sure. And we'll just do it later. So, for this particular case, like there are two solutions to solve this. Uh, the first one is use integers. Like, <laughs> you see those, those swap values for only one decimal point. So, just multiply them by 10 and compare to one solve that. And this is it. Second one is add some epsilon to this 100. But which epsilon do you need to add? Do you need to add 1 in minus 10 power, like minus 9, 1 e minus 9, 1 e minus 10? You don't know that, right? It will probably work, but you, 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 you don't know for sure, right? So let's go. Let's say rounding. It's it's rounding each of the numbers. Like yes. So now let's go back to geometry. We'll, we'll move, for this part of the tutorial, we'll move with this example. So this is orientation test. How many of you know what it does? Okay, so what is orientation test? Orientation test. We have like a segment, oriented segment basically, vector, say. With point P, O, and P1. And we have a third point, P, okay, P2, let's say. Because we have P4 and P3. Uh, so orientation test returns you zero if this point is situated on the line, on the same line. Basically, if it's collinear with the segment, it returns you one if the point is situated to the left, and it returns you minus one if it's situated to the right. So the follow thing that direction is important, right? Because based on the direction, you decide where is left and where is left right. This is one of the basic geometric predicates actually. It's used almost for every like not complex but intermediate geometric geometry algorithm. Like convex school uses it and all the other algorithms basically. So what we have here? Uh, we have a function called orientation. It returns int basically minus one, zero or one. Uh, it accepts uh, four double arguments. So when you compute orientation, you basically take the difference between coordinates of point one and point zero, and be between point two and point one. So those, the first two values correspond to the x and y differences for P1, P, P0, and the 
the x2 and the y2 correspond to the differences between coordinates of p2 and p1. So, what we are doing? We are computing two values. Left-handed side, basically, and right-handed side. The first, this is kind of determinant thing. And it, it, based on the value of it, we can decide where is the point. So if you, like, if you want to go in details of this, you can just search in on Wikipedia or something like that. But for this case, it doesn't matter. So if those two values are equal, you just return zero. This means that the point is collinear, this case. And if left side is less than right side, it's minus one, alpha one. So now what we have in the main? We have double value, which is two in the power of 30. Double has 53 bits of mantissa. This means that this value will have exact representation. So no rounding, it has, if you compare it back to one, to the two in the power of 30, it, it will return true. What we are doing, now we are computing orientation. We are taking this V value, V plus one, V minus one, V. So this LHS will be equal to uh, V squared, right? And right hand side will be equal to V squared minus one. It's usually symmetric. Okay, so what do you think this will output? Zero. Zero. Zero, correct. The reason because why it outputs zero is because it thinks that the second value is the same as the first one. So that means that we can't use this test in some application we want to be robust. And that is how it's implemented in most like geometry libraries and everything else. That's the way we do it. We are not going to do it that way. So let's see how, how we can deal with that. We are moving to robust orientation test. So the first thing, like probably everybody if you thinks about is using some multi-precision types. It's one of the solutions, of course, like we have a few libraries, new libraries probably even, that do that. It will work. It will work properly, actually. But another thing is that it will be very, very slow. I, well, I made some benchmarks, basically. Those were like one and a half years before. So this would be like five times slower than the previous one. And if you use it a lot, it, this will make your algorithm five times slower, basically. So what, what we can do with it? At first, let's think about numeric types we have, like the standard types inside C++. Uh, so, yes? I uh, just wanted to interrupt that typically a multi-precision type allocates. So compared to a couple multiplies, it's not even on the same order in those bacteria to planets. You can have a hundred times slower algorithm. Yes, basically it's heat allocated. So, like, at this point, we allocate six variables, it will be quite slow. So, inside the, like, the standard types we have are basically divided into two types. Well, we don't consider like booleans, enums, and everything else, just integer types and floating point types. So, the first thing you, you need, when you think about integer type, you can think of it like a single value. So, we don't think about overflow right now, just, just integer, integer value. So let's say you have int 64 and another int 64. When you add those, you get another int 64. You don't do any rounding. Basically, when you subtract them, when you multiply them, we won't talk about division, but yeah. You always receive integer type, and it's always precise result. I mean, here we have well, you see, and it's equal to what we would expect it to be, right? Right up until you overflow. Well, as I said, we don't consider overflows. Yeah. Like, it's another problem. But you have the same overflows for doubles with exponent, right? I mean, it's a bit different because we have wider range, but it's still the same. Memory is limited. 
Uh, okay, so for floating point, let's think about floating point types like a segment. What segment interval actually? So it's not a single value, it's actually an interval. So when you have like double A equals some big value, double B equals one, when you add them, you get not what you expect, right? But the value you would expect to get lies within some interval of the value you get. So here you get value C. That means that expected result, the one that you would expect, like the, sum, the actual sum of those two values, lies somewhere in between C minus delta and C plus delta. So now we are going to say, what is this delta thing? So it appears that for floating point types, at least in I double, uh, 3E arithmetic, all the standard operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square root have rounding error equal to one machine epsilon. Mm -hmm. Square root is equal to two. 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 Okay. Maybe. So, this delta is actually equal to C multiplied by epsilon, which is machine epsilon. And we can like pursue exact bounds where expected results should lie in. Any questions? So for example, for double type, this epsilon will be 2 in the power minus 53. So another thing is, if you can see, like if you think about 64-bit integer and double, both of them use the same amount of memory, right? So that means that they could map the same amount of different values. So you shouldn't think like of double like some multi-precision time. Basically it's the same like integer. The difference is in mapping between bits of, of some map between some memory bits and between value those bits represent. So when you have integer type, you have like the same step between each two integers that you can represent. So we have the same amount of integers you can represent in the interval 1, 2, and 3, 4. This value is equal to 3. You can, uh, two, 2. You can represent 1, 2 on the 1, 2 interval and 3, 4 on the 3, 4 interval. This is not the same for doubles. So when you consider amount of values you can represent with double on the interval 1, 2, it's twice as big as the amount of doubles you can represent on interval 3, 4. So the step between the neighboring two doubles increases with the magnitude of the double value. Just the, the statement about it being bounded by epsilon, is that a tight bound or is that just a... It's the, the processor guarantees that it computes in their rounds nonetheless. But so that it gives you the best accuracy it can for your representation, except for some special cases. Like square root, it may uh, guarantee uh, two epsilon because it would require a lot of extra computation for a bit it knows you really don't care about. So basically, yes, you you have guarded bit that allows you to 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 give those guarantees. Okay, and I guess the other thing is, um, are those bounds? Um, are they part of the IEEE 754? Yes. So if I understand correctly, a double or a float has a fixed number of significant figures. Is that pretty much it? Uh, you mean my T sub B? So mm -hmm. what? Significant figures meaning that irrespective of the power, I get like 16 significant digits, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's binary digits. Right. Yes. Yes. Basic idea. Yes. You have like one piece of bit, uh, yeah. bits. You have exponent bits, and you have sine bit for double. And those are like situated in the like. First, you have sine. Bit. After that, you have exponent bit, and after that, you have one piece. Of. It's quite important. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of ideal for scientific calculations, of course, and it's based on actually slight rule arithmetic, right. which is why you have d norms. Well, 
for, like what uh, how I understand why we need doubles. If you multiply two integers, you will probably overflow, right? Like if you well maybe you need three, but you will still overflow. So that's why you use doubles. And the precision they give you, like it's usually 15 decimal digits, is enough for most of the like measurements. Um, I know. Like it's enough for most like experiments probably and everything else. So now we understand a bit like the difference between floating point types that they represent not a single value, but basically when you when you do some operations with them, they stop representing a single value. They represent the range. So uh, just a second. This thing uh, C minus C multiplied by epsilon. In mathematics, it has definition as relative error. Because if you put C outside of the brackets, you'll have C multiplied by 1 minus epsilon. And this is called like relative error. So now I'm going to say a few things about relative error arithmetic. So here you know that the resulting value has one uh, has epsilon relative error basically. We will, we will say it that way. So this C value has relative error equal to epsilon. So now let's say you have two values A and B and they have relative errors like relative error A and relative error B. And you do some operations with those values. So when you add those values, the resulting relative error would be maximum of the two. If A and B have the same sign, basically this means that they have the same sign. So it's addition of two positive values or addition of two neg negative values. Mm -hmm. Let's keep subtra sub subtraction for the moment. So we have, multi we have multiplication. For multiplication, those we just sum them up. For division, it's the same. And for square root, it's one, uh, it's one half. It's basically half of the original relative error. So what about subtraction? Like things are not so good with subtraction, as you can see. So, yes. So that's the error propagation if the errors of A and B are independent, isn't it? So it doesn't hold for the square then. Well, obviously, if it was the square, then it would be the error, the error of A and B are the same, and the max would just be the error of A. But then the laws of error propagation are different. So, this upper bound, this give, gives you upper bound. It doesn't mean that your actual error is as, as high as those values. It gives you upper bound, basically, those approximations. So your actual relative error is less than those values for those operations. Oh. Well, maybe it's a different error model, but for, from physics, from the sort of physics statistical rules and error propagation, it's very important to know whether errors of values are dependent or independent. Well, these are because then the error would actually but even if they are these are rounding errors. So mm -hmm. Purely numerical. It's just a, just a, an artifact of where you decide to round. Um, would, would, if they are dependent, would it be? Well, the, with numerical. the square, you would expect that the error, <coughs> relative error, would square as well. Square? It's, it's oh. a different kind of error. Okay. Yeah, I think it's because you're storing it in this finite representation. Oh, I mean, those, okay. those. Every time you assign a value, you get. A new relative error. Yeah. So those things are like not something I invented. This is mm -hmm. basic stuff in mathematics in relative error computations. Yep. Yeah. So of course you will have this type of error in physics also, but we tend to ignore it um, unless it causes us trouble. But if you were using a slide rule and keeping three significant digits, you would want to do this on the side to make sure your result of your calculation wasn't garbage. So Inside the library, we have a type, which is a wrapper around double type, which is capable to handle also relative error. So it handles the, 
floating point value here, and relative error here. So basically, we overload those five operations, and like we have exact formulas right here. So it's not something like it's not the rocket times to, to do that. And the thing is that those wrappers are quite fast. Well, this is instead of one double, you have two. But operations are the same. Like you don't compute some, you don't compute multiplication of some multi-precision things or something like that. So we are going back to our robust orientation test, and we are going to speed up it a bit. So this thing is the same as we had it before. Multi-precision version. Yes, multi-precision version. Guaranteed robust. Yes, we say that it's guaranteed robust for our case. Also, I didn't make any limitations. You see those values are doubles. So we don't we don't say that they're integers or something like that, yes. So basically, if you don't have a, a, the precision arithmetic that you have, your Voronoi diagram space will be rugged instead of Well, if you don't have it, a smooth line. For the for intermediate input, it won't even finish probably. It will suck fault or something like that. That in most cases, for some small inputs, you can just get some like some degeneracies, basically some intersecting edges or some like, I don't know, some random data and that's it. Because the invariance of the algorithm is uh, violated, this behavior is undefined. It may produce the right answer. Um, well, in like, let's say in more than 50 cases, it would, 50% of cases. But th like there would be some cases and probably if you don't use this at all, there would be a lot of those cases. Like, you even don't need to, to search for them. Just run 10 times algorithm with random data and you'll get it. Yeah, I was thinking like uh, it, the, the cases where the precision will be important are like boundary uh, close enough points, right? That points which is not, not uh, similar to not only. almost almost equidistant to yes. no, no. co-circular points are especially problematic, which can be very innocuous looking. But it's due to the fact of the algorithm we are using because it's based on some circular properties. So. Yeah. And also, every rectangle has four co-circular points, which, uh, when you use real data, it comes up very often. And Voronoi actually uses not only one predicate, there are like a few predicates. So orientation test is just the first one and the smallest one. There is distance predicate, there is a circle event existence predicate, there is um, site event comparison predicate, circle event comparison predicate, yes, yeah, so, and you need to ensure that all of them are flow. Well, you need to, to make some warranties about those. Okay, so we are going to speed up this, uh, this init initial multi-precision implementation. So instead of calling this one, we'll call, we'll call this one, and we'll use robust FPT type, floating point type basically. Uh, so here we do basically the same thing, we just create six robust uh, FPT uh, variables. We compute those and after that we do the following thing. We check if those values could be equal. Like we have the value, we have the uh, relative error for them. Basically it's some segment, it's some interval for one value, for the second value. Now we can see if those intervals intersect. We'll, I'll say something about how this is implemented. But right now, just how the idea works, right? We have two intervals, we check if they intersect. If they intersect, we are not sure what is the exact result. That's why we call multi-precision robust orientation test. If they don't intersect, we know the exact position of, like we know, we can produce the exact result of comparison of two values. Because it doesn't matter where this value in this interval lies and this value in this one, they always have the same position because they don't intersect. So this thing will speed up all the stuff by, like you won't even notice that you use multi-precision type basically. And yeah. Oh, I suppose that if, if the, the two values could be equal, um, I guess they could also not be equal. Is there, there any downside? Did, did you make a sort of policy choice here 
or maybe you don't have any choice. Mm. Well, if you want the right answer, you don't have any choice. You have to resort to multi-precision arithmetic. But uh, you could say if they could be equal, let's pretend they're equal. But then uh, the invariant is violated because it could get them in the wrong order. And if you try to sort that way, you will get the incorrect sorting order. And, uh, and an algorithm that requires correct sorting order may crash. I'm not, I'm not sure if I follow that. I'm just trying to dis trying to figure out if like incorrectly deciding that your point that your line segments are collinear is going to cause any sort of problem, or is it yes. relatively yes. harmless? It, yes. it, it depends entirely on the application, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, in our case, it is harmful. I mean, okay. we, we, are, we are not talking about something. So we'll sometimes do that. Yeah. Okay. So like, for sorting, for example, <coughs> it would be harmful. So it's even very simple algorithms. Is it also true for like higher numbers, like more than 30, like maybe 60, 90? And how does it? Start? You mean here? Yeah. Well, yes. It will, the result, oh, you mean multi precision, precision thing, so right? So like it, if it really captures the precision. Well, the thing is if you add one to double, which is very high, you, you will get the same double as it was, right? So. It, if you want to use it that way, you need to start using some multi-precision yeah. at this point. But do you need that? Like, where do you have about these values? Like, sorry? I mean, like, I'm trying to see if... Uh, so here I'm seeing, like, you know, you are trying to uh, uh, basically uh, trade off between the uh, MP robust orientation, which, which is, like, theoretically should be matching mm -hmm. to infinite precision. Mm -hmm versus a robust orientation which is uh, matching to some, which is having a so solution to some. The, the main point that this implementation is robust and its speed performance is the same as not robust version. Yes. So, so that's the main point. Uh, we're not making a compromise. Yes. So if I understand from a performance standpoint, you want to use the floating point unit because yes. if you don't, you're going to take a huge performance hit. Huge. So, but there, you still have a bunch of twice the operations and twice the memory. I'm trying yeah, to understand. There's two operations on a floating point unit as long as you don't have to go out and grab something from memory or just... So it's, the latency is hidden, but the actual like operation... No, no, we aren't doing the multi-precision if we don't need it. Mm -hmm. It's like a fallback if you get... Yeah, exactly. So well, you know, in your, in your uh, dx1 times dx2, you propagate the error. You, you compute the relative error through the yes. formulas you showed. Oh, that's fast. Which you wouldn't... It is fast, right? But it's well, still the software. The thing right? is also that that error could be integer, not floating point. That's another thing. Okay. And we'll talk about that. I mean, if you had like a large linear system you were trying to solve with some robustness. Uh, it would make all your floating operations too and point operations, And then there would be a small overhead for the In the worst system. case, you have to 1,000 times. Yes, yes the right, right. In your algorithm, so that's, you will that's probably, a valid trade-off. <laughs> in your algorithm, you will probably have not only this operation, you'll have some other operations. So even if it makes this operation twice as slow, mm -hmm. you'll have still some other operations. So that doesn't mean that your algorithm will be like twice as slow. and uh, doing other things that uh, mm -hmm. make the runtime of this guy negligible. This was the Sorry, same practice. Practice. there's not. You're Is not it possible to, to make the first operation in the, with the double tip? Mm -hmm. In most of case, we will be sure with a big epsilon that it yes. will work. And and make the the real operation with the robust type only in uh, the case, the rare case, then uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, uh, difficulty. And then I think uh, in, if you think about uh, uh, performance, on, on this, uh, you know that in most of the cases, we don't have Problem on uh, with a big epsilon, and uh, only make the the robust uh, uh, the robust type use the robust type when uh, in uh, when we we can have uh, uh, problems of uh, precision. Well, the thing is that this is a simple case. This is this is just orientation test. It's not like it's some mass formula of this size and everything else where you won't be able to use. Uh, to check if those values, if those, for example, are close or something like we that. We should probably address that, though. If you choose an epsilon uh, up front, something you figure that's larger than your error, probably, 
You have no warranty that your error is actually smaller than that. No, but the uh, Epson, you can use um, you know, uh, the value of uh, the DEX. It's the, uh, the value of the DEX. So you could or, come up with a yes. quicker estimate to add yes. yet another layer. But then, of course, the practical problems are that if you change the code, you, then you always, uh, always have to remember to also change your quick estimate. The thing and then is I'd also pick that approach. This is kind of automatic thing here. Yeah. The relative <laughs> error doesn't just depend on the size of the values coming in. It depends on how they interact with each other. And so if you choose an error bound up front, it will be wrong in some cases. Your relative error can be arbitrarily large due to subtraction and catastrophic cancellation. Well, I could well, that just... So there's no safe epsilon value. So cancellation error. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the following expression. It's very simple. It's A minus B plus C. We think, like, A could be equal to B, or they are almost equal, let's say. And uh, C is odd larger <laughs> than B. Like, they are... Of completely different order, orders of magnitude. So now let's say we are computing, uh, we are evalu like evaluating the relative error of this expression. So we'll, uh, we'll look at two ways to compute it. Like those, you can at first compute A minus B, and after that add C, and you can uh, compute C minus B, and after that add A. So what is the difference? What are the differences? So in this case, we, like we have, let's consider that we have two values. A minus B is some value D, and C is another value. So we have just addition. In th that case, using the formulas we said before, the relative error will be just maximum of the two. So now we need to compute this relative error. Values A and B are very close to each other. That means that this value, it has like difference in denominator, right? And this will be very close to zero. That means that this value will be very huge, or basically infinity. So the maximum of the two relative errors will be this one, and it will be equal to this value, and it will be infinity. Let's, let's again, it's upper bound, right? It means that the actual relative error is a lot, it's not infinity, it's <laughs> some small value probably. But like, we used our thing, robust FPT type, and we will get this one. So if you compute it other way around, we compute it first uh, C minus B. C is a lot larger than B. That means that the same formula in the same formula, we will basically get relative error of B. Well, if, if you... It would be nearly relative error of B. Yes. But basically, it will be some bounded value, and it will be a relative value of B plus maybe one epsilon or something like that. So you will get quite a pretty nice bound, upper bound. So the problem is how to solve this automatically. Like, you don't want every time to think about those things, right? So basically, if you don't solve this automatically. Every time you do some operation, like sub subtraction basically, you need to check if your relative error is infinity, right? And at that point you need to stop. This will also make your code a bit like not very clean, let's say, because mm -hmm. after each operation you need to check this. So how are we going to solve this? Here is robust difference type. So now let's see you have, you have like a huge expression. Basically, you have like some positive values, some negative values. Doesn't matter if you multiply them; it's still the same. You have some addition, sub subtraction, and other things. So what we are going to do? We are going to put positive values to sub to we are, we are going to evaluate operations with positive values to one variable and with negative values to another variable. And in the end, we just will compute their difference. That's it. So here we have positive sum, negative sum. Everything is very like, 
the structure is also very simple. When we, when we are ready, we can compute difference. But before we compute difference, we have some multiplications, probably uh, additions and everything else. So here I put an example of multiplication. So let's say you have one uh, robust difference type with positive sum equal to A, negative sum equal to B. That means that the actual value is equal to A minus B, right? Well, both those are positive. Even this, this is called negative, but it's still positive. So the second value is represented by, the, by a pair C and D. It's also the same. So now we multiply them. All those values are positive. So actually, you are able to split those onto two values again. And this will be positive and this positive. So this, is, this could be represented at, as robust diff type again. And the key point here is that even though it's more floating point operations, your relative error of the equivalent expression is less because there's fewer subtractions. So, yes. The bottom line is you're just getting rid of subtraction by flipping the sign. And, uh, well, you're, you're deferring you're, it. You're yeah, deferring it. Possible <laughs> second. <laughs> yeah. You will do subtraction, subtraction, but just in the last second right. okay. when you're ready, basically. We do a similar thing in integer where we defer division. Uh, and refactor to minimize uh, the truncation error. So, yes, and you can use this type because you have like the uh, template parameter T. You can put robust FPT type here. So it will be computing all the relative errors for you. It's like the structure is not complicated, it's just to understand how it works basically. Well, that's it. Exactly. Yes. I'm, I'm probably just not understanding something. That's true. But uh, it, it just looks like you're storing uh, the, the value in, in as, as a positive number in one or the other of those. Uh, no, no, it, this is just a constructor. Like, it, this is not the whole implementation. Like, there are a lot many oh. lines in this implementation. Yes, it's not that simple, of course. Okay. Yeah. If you start computing with <laughs> it, then it's both pods will fill up. It's an arithmetic type that supports all the arithmetic operators, oh, okay. and it's uh, accumulating the results into positive or negative. Sum. You can always look at the Vermeer library implementation, and you will see all the de details of this. So you have a number function that like adds stuff to the positive sum or the negative sum. Yes, so there is okay, okay. addition function, there is subtraction. I just I just didn't want to put all of them here because it's not all. Okay. okay. So only one thing. There is a problem with division. You can't divide one robust difference type onto another. And if if you think about it, you'll understand why, right? Because if you divide you'll need to compute denominator basically. But still you can divide by a single value C. So if you divide by some, like, some value C, you'll get A divided by C minus B divided by C. So what that actually means that you need to, when you have like a few fractions, you basically need to have to put them under the same denominator. And in that case, you just compute numerator, denominator, and you are fine with it. But it's possible for, like, it's possible for Voronoi and for Lhasa where B, believe me. So I would say that it's possible for many, many things. Uh, another, another problem. So we have square roots. Uh, well, this is something that is used in geometry, right? Because when you compute a dif uh, uh, distance, you basically need to compute the square root. So there is, like, if you, if you have something simple, like just comparing two distances, it's not a problem because you, you can just uh, compare the values on the square root, right? You, you don't need to evaluate square root itself. Compare the squares because it's not yes. a problem. But in general case, Voronoi deals with those things. Like, you, you can have up to four square roots. So, let's say this is not something about, uh, this is not something about robust FPT type already. This is about multi-precision. So when you go to multi-precision, you need somehow to ensure those things. And that's another problem. Even if you have multi-precision type, you don't have like infinitely long multi-precision type. And square root, like square root of two. You can keep writing it on the board and yeah. So when you have two values, like those two, let's say, 
you know, like we just cut this part and we have two square roots. So we need some way to know. Sometimes we need to know the sign. Sometimes we also need to compute the value. Like if when we compute Voronoi vertices, vertices coordinates, for example, we need to know. Like we, we we use those values basically. So we need to know the exact value for them. So let's so let's see how we deal with this case. So if a multiplied by b is positive, that means well. We don't work with complex numbers, right? So we, we don't think about oh this should be small b. We don't think about small a and b signs because they should be positive. So a and b are of the same sign. That means that we can actually evaluate this. Like we will be fine with our multi-precision type. If they are positive, we just add them. If both of them are negative, we also add them and it's fine. So the problem is if what if they have different sign. So let's say you compute this and you receive zero. Does it mean that it is actually equal to zero? Like maybe it's positive, it should be positive, maybe it should be negative. So what we do, we multiply this stuff by the same value just with minus sign. In this case, and we divide by this value also. In this case, our numerator, we will get a fraction with this numerator and this denominator. Everything is fine with the numerator. We don't have square roots anymore, right? And everything actually is fine with the denominator because A multiplied by minus B is positive. So it's the first case and we can just compute it this way. So it appears that you can do it, like you can go from this case to the case with three square roots. And from the case with three square roots, you can go to this case only. And basically, you can compute the value of this uh, expression in a robust way. So you, you can know that you can compute the resulting value within some relative error. So the, the key point here is there's still numerical error, but we can bound it to a very small value because there's no ca cancellation error, uh, which uh, is uh, multiplication by conjugates eliminates uh, in the case where we would have had it. And if you can bound your error to something sufficiently small, um, then you can uh, create a robust predicate from that, basically. So, the, yeah, so all, but the main problem with the thing is that if you get a, a zero, you don't know if it's actually zero or not, if you don't use this multiplication stuff. And even if you use some multi-precision type, you still need to bound it, right? And let's assume that you receive a zero. Do you know that it's zero or it could be not zero? So that's a technique that gives you a way to deal with those things. If you add another square root, it's not possible, actually. So, well, at least I don't know a way to do that. Because when you start multi multiplying by conjugate, the number of square roots will increase if you have more than four. Um, so, another thing that is kind of important, it's, it's always like Voronoi operates with input, uh, integer input coordinates. And there is a reason for that. Like ensuring robustness for floating point type is kind of complicated. So if you have like type A, very small, type B, very big, you add them and you want to ensure robustness, you need to store basically very large value. Right? You need to store all those zeros, basically. Well, you, you can have some sparse 14 point type, but there are still complications with that also. So a few things why integer input coordinate is, input coordinate type is more than enough for most cases. So in my, one of the tutorials in my li library, I say that 32-bit uh, integer grid is enough to cover all the Mars area within a half of centimeter precision. So it's a huge planet. If you use it somewhere locally, it doesn't matter. If you want you know, better precision, you can use 64-bit integer type, right? And you'll get nanometers precision. So I, like, there is actually no point to use doubles as input. Well, I mean, there, there could be a point, but you can always scale and snap to the integer grid, and it makes sense. 
Because if you get even doubles from somewhere, usually you get them from some measuring device, right? And this device already has some error inside it. This error would be a way larger than the one you get if you scale it and snap. So this, this is one, one of the reasons for Noi and Polygon also operate with integer input coordinates. And well, it, it's enough. Like, you, can, you can try it, I know. Many people maybe just like, don't understand the scale of integer type. So they, get, like, they think it's not like, very wide. But if you try to use it, it would be more than enough. So that was about robustness. We have three more principles, and we don't have any time. So let's be a bit faster. So efficiency. Uh, so the, po the first point when you build any algorithm, you need to, to, like, to think about like, algorithm that is used inside your implementation is the main thing. If, if you have two algorithms, one with better complexity, one with worse complexity, it doesn't matter how you implement them, you will still have this bound running time. Basically, it's complexity. So here, here are a few examples and running time for those. Uh, so be before you, you decide how you will solve some problem, you need to see all the algorithms that you have in the area, decide which one will suit you, basically. And there is a huge difference between, for example, uh, linear rhythmic algorithm and quadratic. This one would be way faster, even if this is faster for small inputs, because it's usually the case. Usually algorithms with higher complexity are a lot easier to implement, right? It's the same with Voronoi's There is a quadratic algorithm that is not very hard to, like, to implement. So choosing an algorithm, after you decided which complexity you want to stick to, you probably will still have a few different approaches. You can see that, for example, on sort algorithm, right? You have uh, like uh, quick sort, uh, you have merge sort, and you have a lot, a lot of different things. Like, and you need to decide which one you want to implement. So you need to research basically uh, advantages and disadvantages of each approach, and that's what we did with Voronoi. So there are three known approaches, each has the same complexity. Three-line incremental approach, which is used by most of the commercial uh, at, at like libraries. It's used by CL, it's used by Leda, I'm not sure if it's used by Voronoi. And the last one is divided and conical. So the advantages of each implementation. Uh, so the main advantage of sweepline is that it's efficient. It's the main thing is because like, like it has a lot smaller constant comparing to all the other. Not to all, by, but to incremental at least, yes. Uh, and it has generic interface. It means you can decouple output from algorithm. You can't do that for an incremental approach because you need always to locate a new point inside your current Voronoi diagram. Well, incremental is basically constructing Voronoi diagram incremental. You insert point by point, you re-evaluate all the regions around the new point, and you proceed this way. And divided and conger is good because it, ha it you can use it to, to uh, you can make it parallel, basically. Well, I'd argue you can make all three parallel using the same complex. But you, but you need to merge them afterwards. Yeah, but it would be the same merge for all three. Well, but uh, just divide and conger is using merge. This this is why I consider it to be a feature of this algorithm, I know. I yes. Guess, I guess we could call it divide and conquer on top of any of the other mm -hmm. two. <laughs> That's something I'm going <laughs> to say, actually. So disadvantages. Um, well, I don't know any, well, all of them are complex to implement. In all of them, you need to think about robust uh, floating point procedure, robust uh, uh, computation, and everything else. Um, the main disadvantages of dividing conger is complex merging step. And of course, it's not documented anyway. <laughs> so you need basically to think how you are going to do that and everything else. So incremental approach is the main disadvantage is it's way slow. And we, we have benchmarks in the end. Not only one benchmark. We compared it with Seagull. We compared it with OpenVoronoi, which also uses uh, 
incremental approach. And it looks like just this algorithm is quite slow. Like, I mean, because it probably has a big constant. Uh, so, so. I would, I would say not being incremental is a disadvantage of sweep line no. because. Uh, yes, yeah, so incremental gives you real time construction ability, basically. Because once you have constructed a Voronoi with sweep line, like you're done, basically. If you want to insert new point, new site, new segment, you need to evaluate everything again. You can use some hashing probably, but we, we don't use it because we want to be fast, right? But if you you can use its boost, it has license, like the boost license allows you to use it in any way you want, basically without informing every, anybody. So you can perform some caching or something like that and make it faster. So to my mind, the ideal algorithm would use sweep line as the first stage to construct for my diagram. It would use incremental approach to continue constructing for my diagram. Because it's possible probably it's probably possible to build like some kind of structure on top of just for my diagram and continue. And well it, it will also implement merging step to make it possible to do it in parallel way. So it will basically take something good from all of these approaches, but it will take a lot of time, so we don't have that. If somebody wants, they can start applying one of those approaches to what we have right now. Uh, and this is how things work in the real world. Usually hybrid algorithm are way better than the single algorithm. So if you look at the SGI, STL, uh, unstable sort, it, it, has, it uses three approaches. It usually it, it uses intrasort by default, but the problem is that it has uh, it has quadratic complexity for some cases. Basically, it's kind of quick sort. So at some point, if, if the recursion depth is uh, exceeded is exceeding some limit, it starts using heap sort, which has uh, n log n complexity basically. And for sm small buckets, it uses insertion sort. And like those guys were not using just simply for the fun, right? That's because some benchmarks were made and everything else. So. Okay, so when you have, when you decided what you're going to implement, when you know your algorithm, you need to decide which that data structures basically you're going to use. And a lot of depend on that, right? So if, if you make one part of the algorithm, uh, of if one part of the algorithm has quadratic complexity, it doesn't matter if another part has linear complexity. Because you'll have quadratic complexity at the end, right? <laughs> so you need every data, data structure needs, if, when you use like a few data structures, you need to be sure that each one satisfies complexity requirements. So, Voronoi is completely implemented using STL. Like, I didn't, well, I have some adapters, but that's it. Uh, and I think if it's enough for Voronoi, probably it's enough for like most of the algorithm. Of course, like, you have 5% of cases where I understand it wouldn't be enough. So, uh, in STL, you have like those few, or few, eight, maybe a bit more data structures. They, they, all of them are kind of different. Right? All of them have different complexity for insertion. All of them have different approaches. Uh, some of them have, uh, are, have memory allocated uh, like consequently some of them just take memory from different parts like map or list, right? They just allocate memory for each element. Uh, so before you start, you, you need to look at the list, decide which data structure suits your requirements. And it's a good point to do. The, the good is that a few of them would, right? So uh, you need to see, because list, for example, stores two additional pointers for each element, the previous element and for the next element. So that's something you need to also to, like, to consider when you choose it, right? Like in Viper, you don't have that, but in Viper, you can't you can't remove in the, like the element inside the vector in the middle because it will take you like linear time. If that's something you want to do, it's fine. But with list, you can do that in all one time. So let's look at the 
Voronoi diagram output structure. You don't need to think about it a lot. Basically, what it, what it has, it has edges, it has vertices, and it has faces. And all of them have pointers to each other. Like edge has four pointers to the next edge, to the to the face to the left, to the next uh, uh, to the next point, for example, and to the neighboring to the twin edge. So those like we have two edges for each actual edge. So it, do it doesn't matter. Basically, they have a lot of pointers to each other. So when I first decided to implement the Voronoi diagram data, stru data structure, I was using lists. So here you see one list, second list, and third list. Like the first one is the list of cells, those are faces basically. The list of vertices and the list of edges. Well, like it's not bad, it worked properly. Uh, the problem is that for each element in the list you use two additional pointers. And it's quite a lot. Uh, but the list was good because in the end when I construct for my diagram I need to to clear it a bit because I could have like a few points in the same point. Like when you, when you have like a square, for example, you'll have uh, you'll have Voronoi vertex with four incident edges. But this will actually in algorithm implementation this will create two Voronoi vertices, and in the end you just need to merge it. So that means that you will do some removal inside these those containers. So it's kind of like you need always, like this was suiting perfectly, but I was not satisfied with the memory. So in the end, I changed it a bit. Now it, it's using vectors. I also have this new method, reserve. So the problem with vector is, once you increase its size, it reallocates memory. That means that all your pointers that you used probably will, will be invalid, right? And that's the main problem with vector. But if you know the size, if you know the upper bound, well, the upper bound is not always good. It's better to know the exact size. If you know the exact size of those things, you can just reserve that space, and you, you will not have any reallocations. Well, it appears that for Voronoi diagram, there are some mess uh, graph, actually graph, uh, CRMs, that state exactly what is what would be the size for all of those. So, like it was possible, but still, in the end, we remove some some elements, right? And it's kind of a problem for writer. But there is one cool trick: if you don't care about the uh, about the order of elements in vector, if you remove one of the elements, you cannot remove it, but just swap with the last one and pop back the last one. It will work in all one time, and it's fine. The only thing, like. And it's work. It works. It's a good. It's a very cool approach. And uh, the only thing is that you will need to update a few pointers, but that's not a problem. I mean, because you will still change them. You will swap, right? So we need to update pointers that were pointing to the previous location. But that's possible. Yes. Did, did you see the the loose stable vector um, container? Well, so <laughs> you pay for it. Though. You do. I, I guess you always, like, if you use one of those, you always pay. But this works. Okay. Yeah, so it's not bad. And this is one of the important techniques. So, like, it was possible to move from lists to vectors. And it reduced memory size by 25 or 30% for the output data structure. So, like, you see, like, those two structures, like a vector and the list, they are quite simple, right? They just store elements inside and they represent the sequence, yes. Just out of curiosity, why didn't you declare your vectors as a pointer to your types? And then you could just, uh, your reserve would just be arrays. It would actually be worse than the list. Uh, or at least no better, because you have the same number of allocations, and uh, uh, a small entity on the heap has a lot of overhead. Well, that would be only if you're foolish enough not to write an, an allocator well, that doesn't do that. Well, then we'd have to provide the fooling allocator to make sure that people using it aren't foolish. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you also try to just mark elements as being deleted. Well, it depends on how many elements you want to delete, of course. 
yes, you can also mark them and like you can mark them and then them. just copy. It's one of the you can use this approach. Or just leave them in. Depending on what the percentage of deleted yes. is, it may but it's be kind process. of like it's more complex, right? Like you mean I mean you need to to put some value, like you need to do some comparison when you need to do when you want to do that and when you don't. Right? Well, ex extraction has an extra. Yeah. Let, let me make sure I understand the reserve right. You're basically saying start out with a vector that has a such and such a capacity. But I know that I will use it. But you know that that in the end I need I I know that I need this size of the right. Right, right, right. Right. Yes. So I basically reserve this size. Right. right. So why would there be any allocation at all? Uh, I so mean, you you could have arrays as class <coughs> numbers and there would be no allocation whatsoever. Well, yeah. You could use an array instead of a vector. Yes. Yes, but that would like mean static array, right? Yeah. Well, not well. Put it as a class member. Right? It would be faster if it was truly static data, but as a class member, it would be pretty fast too. Well, I, I don't think that there is a big difference. Between. Like you, you just do three rel, like you do three allocations here, and that's it, right? You I think you're trying to squeeze out a few pointers in yeah, the Voronoi bingo. diagram itself, but unless you have a million Voronoi diagrams, that doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Here, I believe you've got like one, but the zillion zillion elements. Um, well, it can have a few. It wouldn't matter mm -hmm. at least when you have yeah, like until you have like thousands. Yes, but yeah. I don't think that. In which case, a unique footer of t bracket bracket, if you really do want to squeeze out those extra pointers, mm -hmm. would be useful. But then they don't know their own end. They don't have begin and end. Like vector is really powerful, so using it is often a good idea. Uh, what I was saying is, you have vectors to to store your objects in that are class members, and you use excuse me arrays. And you use your vectors simply to store the addresses of the ones you're using, and and then you get all the advantages of it counting and having. Type. Why? Why would that? That would actually uh, consume more memory. One pointer per element. These vectors store the elements uh, directly within the More allocation operations. What? It yeah. would mean an allocation operation per yeah. If you don't try to allocate it yourself. Well, no, no. Well, never mind. It, yeah. He's using a well, yeah. He's using reserve for correctness, uh, so that y you don't get reallocation that breaks all the interlinked pointers, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's the main point because in any, if if we don't know this number in advance, we won't be able to ensure that we don't do any reallocations. Yeah. Another good point about this thing is that you can do serialization. You can't do that with lists. I mean, in list you have pointers to some other elements in the list, sure. but you don't know position of those elements. Right. right? Here you can uh, you can find the distance from the beginning of the vector using difference of weight, something like that, and you can serialize your data. Okay. Why don't you use indices instead yeah. of pointers then? Uh, indices. Well, I wasn't using indices because if you think of indices, like you have this type, for example, cell type. This means when you want to access from a cell type neighboring, like uh, incident edge, for example, you need to have a pointer to Voronoi diagram that data structure, right? But when it's called, do you, I mean, do you pass the cell type around somewhere, but, or is it always called through the Voronoi diagram? No, no, cell type is a separate type that you can okay. use. That's why I was not using indices. Like, I was thinking about indices yeah. actually, but this will add another pointer to cell type, vertex type, and edge type. Or you'd have to pass it in every time you want well, to call it. Exactly. exactly. And exactly. Yes, yeah. this would be kind of not user friendly. Even if you did that, I believe it would be slower because to access it, you need to take the base pointer and add your index. And if oh, it right. stores direct pointer, bam, you'd be referencing your done. Mm -hmm. Do you actually have in the Voronoi diagram are the the n on each of those vectors? Is that identical? No. No. Okay. So one of them is n, another one is two n, another one is six n. Oh, I see. So the num size calculates them. Yes. Separately. That's why. Would it would it make sense for locality perhaps to have a single struct, I guess, that stores a cell and its associated vertex and edges? Is there a lot of locality there? So I, I was thinking about that also, but like. Depends on what you do with it. This kind of approach gives you ability to traverse the diagram using cells, using vertices, using edges, 
It also like well, you could do that if they were essentially clustered. You would basically say for the first group, look at all the cells, and then for the second one, look at all the cells. You'd be able to traverse it that way. We could store it in a query data structure to get yeah. maximum locality, mm -hmm. uh, particularly a bucketing. Uh, uh, if you write them in the order of the sweep line, they get some locality mm -hmm. just from that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we're making yeah, a big difference, but if list versus mag vector made a big difference, I think it would be something to think about. We have that same problem in like finding element methods where you iterate elements and you need to gather nodes and things like that. And usually we do the same thing where you kind of you look at the algorithm you're going to run on it and you try and order things for locality. There's a there's actually other reasons we would want to use a spatial query data structure to store the Bernoulli diagram, which would give us fast lookup into it, uh, which helps with some problems. And another cool thing came up, of course, that it allows you to implement some random algorithm, basically, on the Voronoi diagram, because with list you can't access random elements, right? So, if you want to use some other structures, like here's a list of those, I, like, for Voronoi diagrams, those were not required, but you can find those in, two of those in C++ environment, and other are in Boost. Is it special index in this? It's not yet, actually. Uh, yeah, but I think they're going to release it soon. Yeah, well, okay. yeah, yes, because I'm waiting actually for results. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> so, one of the things is I didn't mention how we compute like if those two intervals, floating point intervals, intersect. So, one of the things is that you can multiply your relative error, but by your value, right? Compute the actual interval and see if those intersect. But this will require to do some multiplications and something else. So there is a very cool thing that is very fast, and it basically uses just integers to do comparison. Um, this is not from my code, but it uses the same approach, because I use comparison for doubles, and it's a bit big, bigger. So what we actually do, we wrap interpret double bits as integer. And after that, we compare those integers. It appears that if you do that, you will get a bit higher relative error, actually. Like, you will be comparing oh. against a bit higher relative error. But that's fine. Like, that's not something problematic. It won't. Yes. You're right, using the run copy. Well, it's not my implementation, okay. because my mine was a bit bigger and it yeah. won't fit into the screen. And of actually portable. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is not kind of portable, probably, and everything else, but still it's... You can find it on the internet. I, For example, mm -hmm. I found it on some conference in 2006 mm -hmm. about computer gaming. They were using it in some company to do a quick comparison of doubles. Yeah, from Doom, I think. From Doom? <laughs> Maybe from Doom also, I don't know. Yeah, yeah but it's, oh, I like those things, you know. I can, you don't need to multiply doubles, you don't need to do anything, like you just use integers. And it's, that's why it's very fast. And as orientation test, it's one of the basic things. Making it faster makes everything else faster. Also. So, extensibility. Now we're going to talk about how extensible is library. So it took me like a few months, like four probably, after the last conference, because before it was like an, an algorithm, and I was just a student, so I implemented it in a way like, it was working, but it was not not probably user-friendly, let's say. So I spent some time on refactoring all this stuff, and what we have in the end, so we have a basic entity which, is, which implements algorithm. And it's independent of coordinate types, of predicates, of internal primitives. And it's like, it, it's merely just algorithm, and that's it. So you can plug, it, plug into it coordinate types, predicates, and functors using template parameters. Well, and I didn't do this for internal primitives because I don't think that somebody will change those. Those are just simple things without any functionality. Basically, like some side, uh, like some side class, some circle class, and that's it. <clears throat> so another cool thing is that, is, is that algorithm doesn't know anything about output. So you can plug Voronoi diagram into algorithm. You can plug delineate regulation, which is not done yet. That's why it's dotted. 
and you can plug in your axis also. This way it's done. But I just need time to do this. So basically, algorithm doesn't know anything about Voronoi diagram. It just generates events, and Voronoi diagram process, like just processes them, and those are coupled using template parameters. So that's one of the cool things. On, on top of it, you have a uh, main header Voronoi.hpp, which basically is algorithm adapter, and which basically provides just static methods. So. Most users won't even use this stuff. They will just call some static function and that's it. And another thing is that it uses concepts from Boost Polygon. I know if you know about concepts. So basically it allows you like to use your legacy classes. And if they have, for example, members like A and B, which actually mean coordinates like X and Y, you can just use concept on top of that class to be used as a point class, for example. So this part is completely independent of uh, boost, like this in rectangle. Um, it only depends on one header, which is CSTDIN, which, ba which basically ensures that you have in 64 type, you have in 32 type, and that's it. And the point of connection with boost and boost polygon is this header. So that, that's what makes it kind of, I guess, good architecture, because if you don't want to use those, you can just build your own, uh, your own basically, interface on top of the Ronoi builder. So, like, there are a few techn techniques I used. Uh, I didn't use at, at inheritance at all, because inheritance make, makes everything slower. Uh, so when you have a virtual, like, virtual function, basically, and you call it, it takes some time to look up in the virtual functions table to find it. So you can have drop down up to 6, 15%. The very typical implementation of a Bernoulli diagram data structure would declare some base class uh, for an entity in the graph, and then derive from it, you know, uh, cell, edge, uh, uh, node, and then have pointers to base class to each other and uh, dynamically allocate them all on the heap and then try to do manual memory management to clean them up, then it's going to be slow. So, and also like if you use uh, inheritance, you need to pay for the, you need to pay additional memory for storing virtual functions table. So if your structure is very simple, like it has a few doubles, for example, you need to store additional pointers that it will be like increase of in like 20%. Yes. I believe it's really the pointers to the V tables that are expensive because those are per element. Uh, the V tables themselves aren't an issue unless you oh, have like yeah, a million well, yes, classes. It will be like, yeah, you need to store that pointer basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things, like we have a site event and we use the same site event to represent point and the segment. Th it's, this is kind of drawback because of we don't use inheritance. And the thing is, for a point, we just put this point one equal to point zero. Like, this is used inside the Voronoi builder, so it doesn't matter, actually, right? But it's like, it's one of the drawbacks. So it would be probably nicer to use inheritance here, because you can define a class of the site, inherit point site from it, inherit segment site from it. Yeah, this is not bad, I guess. Um, so there are a few other techniques which you also can find on the boost that I described there. So one of those is traits and default template arguments. So basically it makes sense to put default arguments for those things that you don't think somebody will change, right? So for example, for my builder, depends on three template arguments. The first is the coordinate type, the second is uh, coordinate type traits, which you can see there, and they implement a lot of things. So, in most cases, you probably won't need those. But if you want to extend library to your own input uh, coordinate type, you will need to define the things. And this, the last one is for my predicates. The thing is that actually, for my predicates doesn't depend that directly on for my coordinate types. 
it makes some assumptions. It means that those should satisfy some requirements. And th those are described on the library page. So it's kind of also good because you, you decouple predicates from coordinate types. We also have some adapters usage. So one of the things we, like the standard priority read doesn't give you access to, to its elements, right? It supports like five operations, push, top, pop, empty, and size. And you don't have any kind of iterator or something like that. It makes sense because you can corrupt actually data structure, right? But in case you know what you do, you would like to change, like if you have some thing, like some key, you actually use for comparison and some value, which you would like to be able to change, right? Because you are not changing the key. Yes. So here it looks like you're using the seed list as the backing store and then having uh, a PQ of list iterators where you just compare through the list iterators. Yes. This seems actually unnecessarily inefficient because priority queue doesn't do anything magic. It just, whenever you push, it does push heap. Whenever you pop, it does pop heap. I think if you just directly had a vector of T and then imitated what the priority queue did, which is directly in the standard. It's in algorithms, yeah. Yeah, and then you just iterate over it. It would actually be less code and significantly more efficient if this is any way relevant to first. So what, what do you mean? What? Priority queue is a, vector a very, very hand. simple wrapper. Yes. It, it, it's essentially oh, okay. protecting people from looking at the elements and potentially damaging the order. But in this case, you just want to look at them unordered. Oh, I see. What so you, you just sort of want a priority queue yourself. So that's what I wanted to do. Like, it's one of the things, like, I think would improve performance. Another one is... And simplicity in this case. It would be less code. Yes. So, but for the moment, you can consider this as an, an example. Mm -hmm. right? And like you wouldn't have to change your interface at all, which would be the best part. Yes, I agree. I, I would do that, definitely. Another thing I wanted to do, it, it actually, like, the bad thing about STD map is also that you don't have direct access to its elements. And it's something... Yes, you do. You well, can iterate over them. You just can't look at the well, tree structure. Well, you can iterate, yes. You, you yeah. can't use a uh, tree structure. You can that, them that's linear. something for my benefit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it would allow to to optimize some operations, actually. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and the thing that is the main like pattern used inside the algorithm is builder pattern. So basically, for my builder is just director, and it's using builder of the output data structure to construct. Well, there is nothing special in it; just one of the proper patterns of software programming and. This is concrete builder for Verma diagram. Why, why I use this approach is because it hides construction from the user. So user won't be able to, to, to do actual construction. Once they get like the Verma diagram, they can't insert anything in it. I mean, because the, it could corrupt the output data structure. Well, OK, and function object. Another cool thing that is basically used for all the predicates. All the predicates are implemented at function objects. One of the important things about function object object is that they allow you to store some data members. So for example, if you have some multi-precision type, which is very expensive to construct, you can just have a structure with a few of those as a private members. And you won't need to reconstruct, like, you won't need to cut to allocate memory for those each time. And if this, like, I don't need solvent uh, event comparison predicates, I just need one. So it's something that perfectly suits my, like, my needs. And it's, I, I find this trick kind of useful, that you can store some data inside of the uh, functional object. You can't do that for a function. You can find something as a static, but it won't be threaded, right? Uh, if you put under underscore thread in front of it, it is. Because you get a unique mm -hmm. one per thread. All right. Is that portable? It's called thread underscore local in 11. Yeah. If you have a compiler that supports it, which I don't think any do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
so you have uh, ULP comp and 2FT essentially as performance optimizations where the thing can be invoked a bunch of times on a bunch of points, but you don't need to go dynamically allocate the guts of the ULP comp type every time. Yes. You're not like the cells one. Okay, because usually what I've seen is you know functors will bind something here, but here they're just sort of like helpers for efficiency. Well, for example, there I use so, like I use those two inside of those. If I had functions, are like, they, I, would, I would need to create yeah. those right. But are they are they mutable data members? What what are you doing with them? No, no, we recycle so, storage for the one precision, right? No, th basically those are just another function objects that I used inside. Oh, oh, oh they're not multi-precision. No, no, so, so no. This, yes. Oh, okay, I was confused, because I, I thought if they had dynamic allocated memory, then making them movable would be good. So basically, these things compose do uh, doubles within this uh, range comparison, and okay. these things converts uh, like some type to the floating point type. That's another cool thing, like, okay. if you just use static cast or something like that, you will be dependent on cast, right? So it's good to have some uh, structures that do actual conversion. And you can implement it the way you want. Um, so, so there are a few things that are helping to maintain library. Right? You always need to think that you, at some point you'll need to debug it. Uh, it doesn't matter how, much how, much, how many tests do you have. Uh, so always, it's good to have some helper, uh, helper things to help you do debugging. Um, testing is another important thing. Uh, so I was hearing like a few things. I was hearing coverage testing, which was basically testing all the mathematic things. And it was covering all the, bra all the if branches and everything else. Because if you just use random tests, like there are some branches that probably won't be covered by random tests. Particularly once you put in the lazy exact arithmetic, you're never testing your exact arithmetic because the odds of it being called go way down. <laughs> well, and some other things like readability and documentation. Um, so, many people think that if they have like random, random test suit, it's everything they need. But the thing is, if you have just random test, it won't generate these cases. That's why you always need to have some, like it's good to have some random uh, tests that will do like, that will run all the time and do a lot of tests. But it's still, like, it's still required to have some manual tests that will test those corner cases that won't be generated by, by a random test. And here are a few for segments, for example. Those won't be generated also. Uh, usability. So, do we still have some time? So let's go quicker. Uh, Actually, so we're over by 18 minutes. It's okay. Keep okay. Going. <laughs> so, let's implement a simple. Like, now we are going to to talk about how usable is library for the users. Uh, so let's say user wants to implement a function that renders for my diagram. Uh, so we define a few, uh, we define C type traits, predicates, for my diagram traits, we create for my builder, we create for my diagram, we insert points, and we do actual construction. And after that, we do some rendering. Now we're going to see how, using the previous techniques, we simplify this interface to one line, basically. Uh, so default template arguments. Well, I said already about that. It's basically also not to, to specify those, those three. So, it's already a lot simpler. Um, but still, it's not perfect. So, public functions. As I mentioned before in the main header, we define a few those, a few of those that allow us not to use Vermai Builder directly, like here. We just insert points but instead use some, like, use iterators. So we'll end up with this thing. Construct from my points, input begin, input end, and from my diagram that data structure. Um, so there is one bad thing about this. Uh, if we can pass only points there, right? 
if we want to pass segments, we need to implement the same function. And this column construct for our segments. The point is we can't use just construct for array for all of them because we can't have the same implement like this is this is iterator, this is template parameter, this is also template parameter. So like there won't be yes. Uh, if your Voronoi diagram is movable, you could return it by value rather than that's than something I'm going to yes, we are going to more line. Sweet. Uh, so so we, what we'd like to help, we would like to have a single net, like single call construct for my that will automatically deal with points, automatically deal with segments, automatically deal with your class polygons, automatically deal with if you pass grid tentacles. So this is something polygon library is good at. Uh, user doesn't see that actually. But this thing allows to use the same name of the function. Even that's this, uh, like, we have the same basically template parameter there. We have point iterator, we have segment iterator there, and we have type name for my diagram there and there. But we have, like, some magic involved at this point. Uh, so, basically, if you want to, to go deep in that, just look at the boost polygon library and what it does and at the different documentation. Watch my original presentation from 2008. Yes. <coughs> but it allows you to use the same name and automatically detect the type of the things you pass. So, um, it allows us to do basically this kind of stuff. That what, that's what user is going to use. They, they're not going to see all this stuff on top of the function. So now we have things like this. So at this point, we can pass container, uh, which should uh, have begin and operator, which could be container of points, of segments, of polygons, of rectangles. So C++ 11. So using the new in C++, we are able to change this to the following one minor. It doesn't assume that input container has begin and operators. It uses move to move, uh, move operator to move or my diagram. So no mem additional memory allocation will, will be involved. And it's, it's like very simple interface and it does a lot inside, right? How does it infer that it's a double for the Verona diagram? Sorry? How does it infer that it's a double for my diagram and not like a float for diagram? Well, because this is a static method. We just, like, uh, we have some default types that are used. Mm -hmm. If you want to use not double, just use for my builder. Okay. Define your types and just, it, it returns. The yes. Return. But, like, it's the same like with some STL algorithm, right? If you don't, like, there are some default types, and if you want to use with something else, you just need to overload some, for example, for map, you need to overload comparison. And yeah. if, you, if you want some, like, not the standard uh, behavior, basically. So we could look up the geometry type from the iterator type, and from that we could look up its coordinate type, and from that we could look up what's been configured for the Bernoulli diagram type, and well, what to use with that. But that's assuming you want the Bernoulli diagram type to have the same data yeah. type as the no, no, not the same. It's whatever you configured. It would become a tree of your code right then. Oh, right, right. Okay. So, this is like very good, probably user interface. This is more like STL interface where you just call the single algorithm and you get everything you want. And despite the fact that there is some complex algorithm inside, right? So, so let's do recap. It's not very interesting. So there are a few benchmarks involved. So here you can see Boost, which is our library, basically, Seagull and SHOOL. So Seagull is a robust library. SHOOL is a not robust library, which is stated to be the fastest one, but it's not robust. So as you can see, well, here Voronoi is basically performs the same. It's a bit slower for inputs of 100 input points, but that's probably because it uses more complex data structures. So for s -hole, the internal structure could be still in the processor cache, probably, and that's why it's a bit faster. 
because this behavior is only on Linux 64. On Windows, Verma is ever faster. So we have a robust implementation that is faster than the fastest non-robust implementation. Well, and I'm not talking about zero. So this is logarithmic plot, so it's kind of hard to, to see what is the difference between performance. So now let's see the particular case of 10,000 random points. So the smaller the value, the better it is. So this is flying time, basically. So the blue one is boost. Uh, the green one is s -hoop. The red one is seagull. For open Voronoi, basically, the plot is the same as for seagull. And, well, it uses the same approach, but it's not robust. So another plot with 100,000 random points. This is also the prime time in seconds. So Bruno library can strike that in half a second. And this is running on the same hardware, just different operating systems? Yes, uh, well, so this is the same hardware, yes. So this was also my PC, basically. But as you can see also on Linux, 64 is faster. I'm thinking that it probably is because it's 64-bit system. Yeah, I know. If I have Windows 64, I would, I would be able to test this. Which normally the 64 bit build would be slower because the point size is larger. Uh, Maybe doubles a bit faster. Than I don't know. There's all sorts of weird things with, with MSBC 32 and C++ 11. Okay. As I recall, when we target x64, we can assume SSE something yeah. something. That's the and in VC10 and below, we cannot. But in VC11, we do. So it could be a matter of the SSC affecting your doubles. Well, Isn't there less be. register pressure on the 64-bit? I've heard it doesn't actually matter because the hardware is so good at registering any anyways. But you can see that it's twice as slow on the Windows 72 as on Linux 64. But it may be a compiler thing, I don't know. Do something. Jeremy, this is the compiler guy from Microsoft. <laughs> I'm a library guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm behind Vector. <laughs> OK, and we have some user experience. This was rendered by Phil Endicott, one of the guys from the boost case. Uh, this is one fifteenth of the original image, actually, because it contained 200,000 points. And this is DNA triangulation. So that means this is not like DNA is not part of the boost. But Phil was able to do that in one hour using Voronoi Builder API. So you just get the Voronoi and then you build the dual and then you plot it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, actually he asked me, but I was somewhere outside home, so I wasn't able to see. So meanwhile, he was able to do that on his own. Yeah. <laughs> so he just implemented the LNA triangulation. Very simple, mm -hmm. but still. Yeah. That's it. Yes. So when are you proposing this thing for Boost? Well, it's, it depends on the group, I guess. Well, 1.5, it can be released whenever I approve it ready for release, which is you know, code, uh, documentation, and testing. Mm -hmm. It's already passing all the tests on shrunk through all the platforms. Uh, the documentation looks reasonably good, uh, and uh, I've been following the code all along following all the uh, inspect tools guidelines for boost. Um, we were careful to make it portable. There's proof that it's portable that is passing the tests, of course. Mm -hmm. 